Well, I'm sure that uh, most people in this room uh, are here precisely because they have enormous concerns over the rise of Islamophobia. Only last Friday, we heard about the mosque in Tipton having a nail bomb that um, did go off. Fortunately, the majority of people who were due to be at that mosque were not there because it was Ramadan, but nevertheless, the nail bomb did ignite and explode and caused a huge amount of damage. In Fife, which is just outside of Edinburgh, where I come from, the um, Islamic Centre there has been daubed with racist graffiti. And of course this um, you know, is also the case right across the country. In Liverpool we know that a bomb was left at the al Rama Mosque uh, where there were 200 people that were coming to pray. And it isn't just mosques and Islamic centres that have been... I will try. <laughs> Sorry, could you please just let the speaker finish? Yeah, if you can... So, so, Sorry, please. Right, okay. The ones that I've just mentioned have taken place in the last two weeks, okay? Um, if I continue to repeat the dates of all of them, I won't be able to finish everything else, so please bear with me. As I said, it isn't just the mosques and um, Islamic centres that have been attacked. We've also had uh, Muslim cemeteries and graves that have been desecrated in Newport with swastikas and letters of the EDL all over the place. Um, a um, watchdog, which is called the Tel Mama Project, the Measuring Anti-Muslim Attacks Group, um, has recorded 212 Islamophobic incidents in the week after the killing of Lee Rigby. And of course that killing certainly has uh, acted as a lightning rod in terms of racist feeling that they have a bit more confidence across the country, a bit more cocky to go and have a pop at Muslims and at places that Muslims worship at and symbols of, 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 uh, of Islam. Um, the slogan, Never Surrender, and the EDL were also um, daubed um, across um, the Muswell Hill Mosque, which of course was completely um, levelled to the ground in North London in June. Um, around half the mosques and Muslim centres in Britain have been attacked since 9-11, according to a recent report that was published. Um, the Home Secretary, Theresa May, in the light of the Lee Rigby um, killing, turned around and said that she wanted to expand the powers of the TV watchdog Ofcom. What this would be able to do would be to ban radical preachers from television and block extremist messages from the internet. Boris Johnson, Lord Mayor, uh, the London Mayor, said that universities must monitor Islamic societies. When um, the murder of Lee Rigby was, uh, was being announced and covered, the BBC correspondent Nick Robinson wrote to those who were offended, because if people remember, he said that uh, the people who were described as the attackers were described as being um, of Muslim appearance. And when he was attacked over this and uh, um, asked to justify it, he did justify it. He said, to those who were offended by my describing the attacker as of Muslim appearance, I was directly quoting a Whitehall source quoting the police. It's very, very clear that how anti-Muslim racism, Islamophobic ideas have been coming from the top of our society in terms of politicians. Um, a recent YouGov poll showed that one in three people in Britain think that Muslims are a threat to democracy. So there has certainly been a ratcheting up of racism towards Muslim, and in many quarters this is quite rampant. Um, there's a think tank which is called the Quilliam Foundation. I don't know how many people are familiar with this, but it was established by a former member of Hizbut Tahrir, uh, which is an Islamist organisation. Um, and this organisation has really dedicated itself to stating that the real threat to democracy, the real threat to our freedoms and values of justice are represented in this very pernicious ideology which is political as well as religious in terms of uh, Islamic uh, is, is Islamicism. Uh, and the think tank and the research that it conducts is something that is used not just by politicians in this country, but it's also used by politicians in the United States, um, across Europe and what have you, to really specify that the main threat that we are facing is, is the right of Islamic extremism 
uh, both in terms of its violent form, but also um, in, in, uh, in everyday society. And this is something that we have to guard against. And of course, this isn't just a uniquely um, a British phenomenon. Uh, right across Europe, um, we've had Angela Merkel, the German Chancellor, who said that um, multiculturalism, as she perceives it, by which she means that, you know, that there are so many Turks, i.e. Muslims, inside of Germany, represent a problem for Europe. And there's this real sense of fear that somehow in Europe, the hordes of Muslims, and this is the way that they are depicted, are coming into Europe. There's a real fear in which Europe is becoming Eurasia. And this is the kind of language that is used to, uh, to describe what, uh, what is happening. And really what this demonstrates is how entrenched Islamophobia is becoming, is becoming in, our, in our world today. Um, when people try to think about where Islamophobia comes from, in many respects it's quite understandable, especially for Muslims, to feel as if, well, Islamophobia, because it's directed at them at a very personal and intimate level, based upon their faith, and therefore the symbols of attack are symbols of their faith and their community in terms of mosques, in terms of uh, community centres, in terms of cemeteries, their language, their clothing, etc., etc. It's very, very understandable why many Muslims feel that this form of racism, if you like, is something which is specific to them. Um, it's based upon religion, it's cultural in form, and therefore it is distinct from pre previous forms of racism. Um, in Edinburgh we had a meeting two weeks ago, um, a United Against Fascism meeting, and there was a woman who was a convert to Islam, um, she's white, and she made a contribution where she said that just because I'm white does not mean to say that it's any different for me than it is for any of my brothers and sisters who have brown skins or black skins, and this is because it is religious and it is cultural. And the whole way in which Islam is presented as being quite alien to British values, <coughs> as being quite alien to Western, to Western culture, of course is not anything particularly new. It has a long historical, historical narrative which has existed within the Western world. The intellectual framework for this was very much provided through the prism of Orientalism and the writings of Edward Said. The whole notion that somehow the Orient was the other, um, the object if you like, and that the West was the subject, um, and that the West, when it embarked upon a colonial project, this was really a civilizing mission that it was seeking to, to perform across the East in terms of looking at Eastern societies, noting that they were backward, noting that they were deficient both in cultural forms, in um, intellectual developmental forms, and therefore it really required the civilizing power of a colonial power to, uh, to, uh, to, to bring it into the 20th, to bring it into the 20th century. Um, and the denigration of non-European peoples um, is something which is based upon very much this idea that their culture is inferior and therefore the West is superior. Um, because I teach in South Asian history, um, you know, the, the, one of the big, big colonial officials um, at the beginning of the 19th century, a man by the name of Thomas Babington Macaulay, he was an East, East India Company official. <coughs> Um, and in India, um, he had this very famous minute, it's referred to, the 1835 minute of education, where the British were trying to, um, try to formulate an educational policy um, across India. And he said this, I have no knowledge of either Sanskrit or Arabic. So remember, no knowledge of Sanskrit or Arabic. But I have read translations of the most celebrated Arabic and Sanskrit works. And his conclusion was, in them, I have never found one among them who could deny that a single shelf of a good European library was worth the whole narrative literature of India and Arabia. Um, the intrinsic superiority of Western literature is indeed fully admitted even by the members of these inferior cultures and what, and what have you. Um, and then to, uh, he continued in terms of further defining what the role of the British was in India. He said that we must at present do our best to form a class who may be interpreters between us and the millions whom we govern. We have to, we have to provide a class of persons, Indian in blood and colour, but English in taste, opinions, in morals and in intellect. So making it very 
wherever he is. It's, it's quite interesting because, you know, it, it appears very, very crude and quite naked in terms of what it is that, uh, that they are performing. But, you know, this really sort of underlies, if you like, the 19th century dominant intellectual, political attitude that there was to the Orient, and particularly the peoples of the Orient. Um, now, of course, the inferiority of people in the East, the othering of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of people who were non-Western, found its 20th century expression over the issue of culture. So, in 1978, a year before Thatcher was elected as Prime Minister, she was interviewed on a World in Action programme where she was asked about her policies if she were to become Prime Minister, and she was asked specifically about her policies on race. Um, and this is a speech that has become infamous for being referred to as the swamping speech because she said that people are rather afraid of being swamped by people from a different culture. She said that the British character has done so much for democracy, for the rule of law, but their fear is that if it is going to be swamped, then people will have a tendency to react. And of course, this was also in the late 70s, providing succor for people who were racist, for those who were the supporters of the National Front, who could justify that, you know, what they were really doing in terms of their opposition to immigration, in terms of their opposition to the presence of, uh, of, uh, of black people, and particularly of Asians, was that you know, it was just natural because there were just too many of these odd aliens in our midst and, uh, and what have you. And it's quite interesting, Thatcher's use of the term culture, um, in some ways far more significant than perhaps the use of the term swamp. Because the language of race, particularly by the late 70s, um, had become very, very unfashionable. It had become partly unfashionable because, of course, the idea of biological racism being associated with uh, experiments in Nazi Germany and genocide. But it has also become quite unfashionable as a result of very heroic struggles that had taken place throughout the 60s and 70s of black and white people against racism to challenge this, uh, this uh, uh, blatant racism. So, of course, for people who were racist and hadn't changed their minds, the term culture became a pseudonym for talking about race. Um, if you wanted to talk about um, sort of, you know, how people were different, how you didn't really like other people because of their skin colour, because of their language, and they smelt because they were, they were packies and they ate chapatis and what have you, you talked about it in terms of culture. And therefore these cultural differences were seen as representing such an enormous gulf between people who were distinct from British culture, from British society, from British values, that really this was beginning to represent some kind of problem in British society. Um, and it's quite interesting because, of course, today we associate um, criticisms and attacks on multiculturalism with coming from um, Cameron. But the first attacks on multiculturalism didn't emanate from his future grips. Back in, the, back in the early 1980s, the attacks on multiculturalism came in the form of a school teacher, a headmaster. His name was Ray Honeyford. He was the headmaster of um, a school in Bradford. Um, this was a school which had over 80% of its intake were people, were children who were from an Asian background, a Muslim background. And he argued that the education of white children in this setting was going to suffer. It was going to suffer precisely because they were in a minority and that the dominant culture was Muslim. And what he meant by this was that he found it was unacceptable for children not to be speaking English. So he argued against mother tongue teaching. He also said it was absolutely preposterous that uh, Christmas should not be celebrated and that instead we are having Eid. He also said it was ridiculous that children were being permitted to, take, to uh, be, be taken off to the subcontinent on holidays for long periods of time. And he continued in this vein. His, um, his views were articulated in an article uh, which was attacking multiculturalism and multicultural education in the Salisbury Review, which was a right-wing journal. Um, it belonged to the neo-con wing, con wing of, the, uh, of the Conservative Party in the 1980s. Um, and in this, he elaborated on his views about multiculturalism. And for him, this represented a real pernicious threat to, uh, to British values. Um, and particularly over the issue of how in the curriculum 
there wasn't what he perceived, what he considered British Christian education. He argued that you had to have a uniform education system that brought everybody together. That sounds quite, quite liberal when he puts it in these terms. But again, the language that he was using was coded through culture, language about religion. And language, of course, has been quite critical to manufacturing ideas about the other of Muslims in our society. Um, the debates over Muslims as being different from our society were to find further expression when a few years later in 1987, after Honeyford had come out with his speeches and his articles, a group of 26 white parents in Dewsbury decided to remove their children from a predominantly Asian school. And again, they said, oh, we're just exercising freedom of choice here because we want our children to have a Christian English education. And in this particular school, they make chapatis and not pancakes on Shrove Tuesday. And therefore, this is representing a real threat upon our children's cultural heritage. And you know, this is no joke. This was their, their justification for trying to take their, their children out. And what, the, what these particular instances did throughout the 1980s was really begin to create a whole phenomenon whereby people could not only begin to talk about racism in some kind of semi-respectable language in terms of talking about religion and culture, but far more insidiously where a specific minority group, Muslims, were being targeted for being different in British society. By the time that the 1980s come to an end, there is a further row that is about to erupt, which really begins to cement and crystallize the ideas that today we are perhaps understanding as Islamophobia. And this comes in the form of a novel, the novel Satanic Verses by, by Salman Rushdie. It was published in 1988 in India, where it was banned immediately. No, no Western government banned it, but in Britain when it was published in 1989, for a variety of reasons, which I don't have time in, to go into, if people want to raise them, they can. Um, but some Muslim leaders began to see this book as representing an attack upon Islam. And that consequently, there were demonstrations taking place uh, in British cities. Uh, the first one took place in Bolton, but the second one was in Bradford. And the one in Bradford was particularly notable where the media was present because a copy of the book was burnt. And suddenly, right across the newspapers, in the, in the bourgeois newspapers, the right-wing newspapers, people began to talk about, oh my God, we've got mad mullahs in our midst. These people are preaching hate through their mosques. Look at them, they're burning books. People began to describe Muslims as being akin to Nazi book burners in the 1930s. Um, and again, what this was doing was beginning to crystallize this idea of the intolerance of Islam, that Islam did not permit any critical thinking. Ideas begin to evolve further from this, which went along the lines of, well, you know, you may criticize Christianity, but at least Christianity had a reformation. At least in the West, we had an enlightenment. The problem with Islam is, is that it had no reformation, and therefore, it's just what the word of the book is, and this is what people are taking as literal, and therefore, there is no space for any kind of critical thinking and for people to have alternative views. And we can see this in the examples of the intolerance displayed towards Salman Rushdie demanding his head, the book burnings, the idea that, um, that children can only speak their mother tongues, they don't want to, they don't want to integrate into British society, uh, into British society and what have you. The, um, there was a, um, a daytime program on at the time, presented by Robert Kilroy Silk, who had been a Labour politician. Um, and of course he's now um, most recently associated with UKIP, but he turned around in the midst of these demonstrations and said that if Britain's resident Ayatollahs cannot accept British values and laws, then why should we accommodate them? And again, this was code for this, these people are a problem. Everything to do with them, their religion, their ideas, their very presence is an absolute problem for British society. Um, again, people think about the idea of um, Muslims being accused of self-segregation, that Muslims refuse to integrate. Again, we associate this with, uh, with current debates that have taken place um, in the last few years. But again, back in, uh, back in the 1980s, in the late 1980s, um, the debates over segregation were coming up then as well. 
because in February 1989, the Conservative Home Secretary at the time, Douglas Hurd, as a result of what had been happening over Rushdie, um, turned around and uh, made this statement. Um, he said that no way are we going to have any changes to the blasphemy laws, because this is what some Muslim leaders were demanding um, for, for, uh, for Islam. But he went on to cajole British Muslims to join the mainstream, not to be outdone. Um, his successor, John Patton, um, said in July 89, he sent a condescending letter to a whole range of British Muslim organisations, uh, which included homilies on the need to gain fluency in the English language and lessons on how democracies worked, because of course Muslims have no idea how democracies work, and particularly on what it means to be British. Sadly, this was not something that was confined to the Conservative Party and the right. Faye Weldon, a feminist critic, a writer, uh, who many, many of you might be familiar with her works, at the time she turned around and said, the Bible provides food for thought, out of which you can build a decent society. The Quran offers no food for thought. And she wasn't alone in this. There are a whole series of intellectuals from Melvin Bragg downwards who for very understandable reasons, wanted to defend the right of Rushdie to publish his book. We as socialists also defended the right of Rushdie to publish his book. We were against censorship. But these particular liberals went one step further because they completely bought into the idea that British society had enshrined in it democracy, tolerance, liberalism, and that Islam represented the total antithesis of this. We're very familiar today with the role that imperialism and imperial wars have been pre have presented in terms of crystallizing the notion of uh, Islamic extremism and Muslims being a threat to democracy and how this has been crystallized over, um, over wars such as uh, following 9-11 and what have you. Um, but again, the end of the 1980s and the beginning of the 90s, the role of imperialism was absolutely crucial um, in terms of fusing, fusing itself with a form of cultural racism. And this was particularly over the first Gulf War. Um, and this was when Iraq had invaded Kuwait. And there was a whole orgy demanding that we have to go out and liberate poor little Kuwait. And the first Gulf War takes place uh, when, uh, when the Amer Americans um, send 150,000 troops to Saudi Arabia and a war, a, um, an attack is launched upon Iraq. The reporting of this war, CNN reporters talked about this being a turkey shoot. Um, when they started to attack Baghdad, it was described as being like the 4th of July. We're very familiar today with the idea of, of embedded journalists, because throughout the, um, throughout the war um, on Afghanistan and Iraq, this is what we've come to be familiar with. Well, embedded journalism began. Um, and really crystallized in this first Gulf War, where uncritically, Western reporters went and just reported exactly what the Western media wanted. And this war was meant to be, you know, it was a smart war. Um, it was a war that was squeaky clean, where only really bad guys got killed. The whole notion of collateral damage was introduced in this way, completely sanitizing the, sh the violence and the brutality that was meted out to Arabs um, and Muslims right across Iraq. Oh, over 200,000 Iraqis were leveled to the ground as they tried to surrender. It was an absolutely brutal war. But what was crucial about this was how the role of imperialism, the desire of the Western powers to protect their, to protect their pro profit interests in the Middle East in terms of oil, completely went hand in glove with using notions of Muslims as being separate. The idea of Islamic fascism is something which emanates from this period. Um, Fred Halliday, who had been one of the editors of New Left Review, was the first to come out and say that what we are witnessing today in Iraq is Islam with a fascist face. He said, if I have to choose between imperialism and fascism, like we had to in the 1930s, I will choose imperialism. And again, many people on the left, it wasn't just the liberal intelligentsia, but sadly an awful lot of people on the left also brought into this idea that what we were witnessing in terms of um, Islamicism was something which was very distinct, very different from anything we had seen before, and that this really represented the biggest threat 
to, to, the Western, to the Western world. And of course, this was further sort of fueled by the demise of communism. Um, the NATO General Secretary in 1995 made a speech in Brussels where he said, make no mistake, Islamic fundamentalism has come to replace communism as being the number one threat to Western democracy. What I've tried to illustrate here is that what we understand in the contemporary world is Islamophobia is not something which has just started at this moment in time. Okay? The ideas of Islamophobia are things that has, has developed in layers over a period of over 30 years um, in, the, in, the, in the modern period. But as it has developed and as it has evolved, it's also important to understand that it isn't something which is distinct or separate from wider forms of racism. You know, the idea that Muslims are segregated communities, the idea that Muslims refuse to learn English, the idea that Muslims don't want to integrate into British society, etc., is a way of trying to pathologize Muslim Muslim practice as a way of trying to pathologize the Muslim communities if somehow it's in their genes or whatever. And this is really not that distinct from the way that racism has talked about African Caribbeans in British society, that men are feckless, they just, you know, go around Britain sowing their seeds left, right and centre and then just walking away from their responsibility, um, that they're just into criminal activity, they don't provide, uh, African Caribbean males don't provide a safe male model for their children and this is the reason why African Caribbean children are not doing so well in education, etc, etc. It not only helps to pathologise um, the deficiencies of people as lying in their own culture, but it is putting the blame for racism on the very victims of racism itself. And when we think about Islamophobia today, you know, Islamophobia and anti-Muslim racism, not only is it something which is distinct from wider forms of racism, but it could not exist in our society without the existence of the older forms of racism. What Islamophobic ideas have been doing is taking the older forms of racism and translating them into a new, into the new world um, that it finds itself in to, uh, to, uh, to, to scapegoat a minority. There are a few other things I want to say. I said that racism was coming very much from the top of society. The question of the state and state repression is absolutely crucial here. The way that the state has tried to divide Muslims particularly since 9-11, but it predates that. You know, the idea that there are good Muslims and bad Muslims. You can only be a good Muslim if you are completely uncritical about the policies of the British state, be that in wars abroad or be that at home. If you dare to criticise, then you're a bad Muslim. And hence all this language about, you know, Muslims have got to clean up their own backyard. The idea that all Muslims have got to get up and condemn the killing of Lee Rigby because all Muslims share in this collective uh, in this collective responsibility and what have you. Uh, but also, of course, the level of state repression. I mean, you know, the, those six um, young men from Birmingham um, who were going to try and travel down to where the EDL were going to be um, to go and attack them. I mean, apart from the fact that they were completely cavalier and stupid, I mean, you know, I'm not particularly good at this kind of stuff, but, you know, I'm sure that there are other people that could have given them good advice as to how to attempt to confront the EDL. But, um, you know, they're the sentences that have been handed down to them. 18 years, right? Nobody was killed, nobody was attacked, but 18 years these young boys have been given. You contrast that to the Kit Glove approach that the British state takes to the likes of, uh, of, the, of the EDL. You know, just today I heard that the Oxford um, Students' Union idiots are thinking about inviting... What's his name? Oh, Tommy, Robinson. Tommy Robinson over to, de yeah, to debate about um, you know sort of like multiculturalism and British identity you know gives you an indication of how there are two very you know two very distinct um, distinct um, um, ways in which um, in which the racists are being treated the fascists are being treated and Muslims are being treated so the question of the state and what it's doing not just in terms of its policies but also then the way that it attempts to silence people who are critics of it, um, either directly by imprisoning people with draconian, draconian sentences, or by deporting people, by detention without trial and what have you, or without any charges, is absolutely horrific. And of course what this is about is trying to, to sort of create this atmosphere to maintain a climate of fear 
that what all of us have to worry about is a woman that's wearing a headscarf because she really is the biggest threat to your livelihood and to your, and to your civilization. Um, but there are a few other things I want to say. And one is that, you know, it's very tempting for people to think, especially after the murder of Lee Rigby, that, you know, oh, you know, that was awful. And yes, of course it was awful. But it's very tempting for people to say that, therefore, the Islamists and those that are influenced by them are just as bad as the racist and as the Nazis. Uh, this is very tempting. Um, Russell Brand, I believe, tweeted or whatever or on his Facebook following Lee Rugby's murder that um, you know, the, the people, the, the perpetrators of, uh, of this murder were just as mindless, just as stupid, just as moronic as the EDL who want to take advantage of this. Um, I think that that's a wrong position to hold, okay? You know, I'm a revolutionary Marxist, I'm an atheist, don't believe in any religion whatsoever. But that does not mean to say that we do not understand why people may turn towards religious ideas, and particularly in terms of Islamicism. You know, people have turned, when I talked about Salman Rushdie earlier, part of the reason that so many young British Muslims were going on demonstrations demanding that Rushdie, Rushdie's book be banned, is also because they were reacting towards the racism that they were experiencing in British society day in, day out, that was pillorying them in schools, in their communities, in the media, and what have you. The reason why people have um, been sympathetic to certain Islamists and why people have been drawn to various jihadist groups, whether it's in this country, whether it's abroad, is precisely because of the role that Western policy plays inside the Middle East, not just in terms of wanting to control its oil reserves and lead barbaric wars against Iraq and Afghanistan, but also, of course, in the way that Western regimes have propped up selective Islamic regimes, i.e. the despotic countries of Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states that they back to the hilt, but also, of course, the way that Western power has backed the state of Israel for over 60 years. These realities in the world that we live in have fueled um, Muslim, Islam, Islamicism and Islamist ideas across the globe. But the problem is, is that it doesn't matter how angry you are and how tempted you can be to confront um, imperialism or to confront racism by thinking that, you know, or you can just take out a soldier, you can just take out a plane, you can just go and attack 10 Downing Street or whatever. At the end of the day, the might of various Islamist groups is never ever going to be the same as the might of a capitalist imperialist state. And that has been proved time and time again. So, you know, my criticism of Islamicism is not the same as Russell Brand's. My criticism would be that it is completely the wrong strategy with which to attempt to challenge imperialism and racism in our society. And the final thing to say here is that, you know, in the face of all of this, the whole you know, historical way that Islamicism and anti-Muslim anti -Muslim racism has, uh, has been demonstrated across, uh, across our society has led Muslims obviously to different responses. One has obviously been the response of going into jihadist groups and Islamic terror groups. The other response is quietism, the idea that somehow they can just withdraw from existing society. Um, if you like, it's a, you know, a do-it-yourself lifestyle Islamicism, if you like, you know, that just don't engage. Um, don't be involved in anything, just go to your own community centres, go have your own schools, and that somehow that will, um, you'll be, that will help you to escape the worst forms of racism. Well, you know, you can't exist in a bubble, right? You just can't exist in isolation from the rest, from the rest of society. But not only can you not live in isolation, but what it doesn't do, what neither the jihadist, Islamist extremism, or the idea of withdrawal from, uh, from mainstream society do, does, is that it doesn't actually put forward any kind of strategy as to how you can deal with or tackle Islamophobia. You know, for us as revolutionary socialists, we start from the premise that Islamicism, sorry, that, Islam, that Islamophobia is not natural, it isn't something which is God-given. It also isn't something that is based in religion. It is built upon previous forms of racism, and that, and that racism is always being used to try and divide us from each other. We don't believe it's cultural in any shape or form. You know, as far as I'm concerned, we have a multiracial culture that we have to celebrate and build upon. And therefore, the real strategy to try to fight um, Islamophobia has to be one which is based upon 
people coming together, Muslims with non-Muslims, atheists with religious people, black and white in unity, but it's also a, qu a class question as well. Because, you know, there are, there are some, uh, the way that certain Muslim leaders in the community have been attempted to be co-opted by the state is also an issue. Um, and for certain leaders, and particularly those who have business interests, those who, um, who are politicians, those who are councillors, those who are MPs, they're not particularly interested in wanting to have a branch and root transformation of our society. They're quite happy with existing society, just as long as they can have a space for themselves in it. Their interests are not the same as the interest of working class Muslims across Britain, who are at the very brunt of Islamophobic um, ideas and racist attacks and what have you. And for those Muslim working class people, their interests are far more in common with other working class people, whether they're white, whether they're atheists, whether they're non-Muslims or whatever, together in terms of really trying to think about a strategy that can not only begin to tackle Islamophobia, but also attempt to tackle the society on which Islamophobia and racism is being built upon. I just wanted to say a bit about the satanic verses because I think Talat was really right to see that as a very seminal point in the development of the whole arguments against Islam. And I think the role that socialist worker played was really crucial at that time because on the one hand we defended the satanic verses and said that it was an attack on Thatcherism at a time when Salman Rushdie was an anti-imperialist before he sort of went over to sort of being um, supporting the whole imperialist project. But at the same time we did carry the argument that the young Asians that were coming out on the demonstrations, for them it was a chance for them to fight back against the racism that they were undergoing. I think the fact that Socialist Worker actually carried those arguments was really important. It confronted to some extent the racism that was there, but I think it also helped to start to make some of the links that we could then develop further on with the Stop the War movement. We actually had a credibility uh, with that community. I just wanted to say one other thing as well, which is that I think that it's right that Islamophobia is a really key uh, part of racism at the moment, but I think it's a cover for just uh, a general hatred of anyone that's got colour. I just want to give an example from Barnsley where we've been working with uh, a family of asylum seekers. They're from Sri Lanka, they're Catholics. Um, the guy, Harsh, who was walking through the centre of Barnsley a few weeks ago, he's got lovely long black hair. He was beaten up by um, a load of thugs coming out of the pub who were convinced that he was a Muslim. As far as they were concerned, someone who was black and had long hair was um, uh, a person that they could just turn out and attack. It shows to some extent the uh, idiocy of these people, that they can't sort of identify people. They think that people can be identified in some way as Muslims. But it does show that at the, the end of it, I think, that they just hate anyone who isn't white. And we have to stand up um, against Islamophobia, knowing that if attacks go on against uh, people that are Muslims, it will generate out to everyone eventually. I think it was really useful that Talat underlined in the way that she did about the um, pre-existing forms of racism that have helped to fuel Islamophobia in its current form because I think it's very important that we see that this isn't just a new phenomenon, that it draws on all those older currents of racism because it helps us to understand that this isn't just about Islam, this is actually about racism. Um, and it's not about religion, and it's not about culture, but this is actually a form of racism. And actually it's probably the cutting edge of racism in Britain at the moment. But you see, I think as well as drawing on those older forms of racism, I think the events of 9-11 and 7-7 gave an absolutely massive boost to the narratives of Islamophobia in Britain, because they then led to the state portraying all Muslims as somehow some kind of suspect community who then had to be dealt with by a dual strategy of either repression or co-option. And what do I mean by this? You see, tell it's quite right, there are lots of reasons that might drive people to, to coming around Islamic groups or to looking to their religion for political organisation or all these different things, the racism that people face, the anger that people feel at imperialist wars abroad, the anger at what's happened with Western backing to people across Palestine. And every survey that looked at what is it that draws young Asian people towards Islamic ideas or Islamic organisation says that these are some of the issues that people care about and that are making people angry. 
Now, the state obviously couldn't acknowledge any of those things, because acknowledging any of the, that there may actually be some causes for any of these issues would be admitting that they have done some serious injustices in the world. So instead, the state creates a narrative that all Muslims are somehow terrorists, and somehow have within them the seed to become terrorists. And the response of the state to that is therefore a mixture, isn't it? of all the repression we've heard about, the anti-terror laws, the ways, the massive injustice that we've seen with it, the repression that's come with that, and the attempt to co-opt strategies such as the prevent strategy, the anti-terror strategy that New Labour brought in, that was about state sponsorship for the good Muslims, about exactly what Talat talked about, let's drive a wedge between the supposedly good Muslims, who we will hand out lots of money to, as long as they agree with what the government says, and give cover to the new Labour's wars, and give cover, now obviously the Tories revamped it down a different line, but give cover to government policy, or you're a bad Muslim. And, and this is the dividing line, and this has been used to try and silence, actually, the voice of angry, young, not just young, angry, young and old Muslims in Britain. And my final point really is kind of where Tala ended, because I think it's also very important that we remember that Muslims in Britain, or around the world, are not just victims in all of this. And actually, Muslims have been lived in Britain for hundreds of years, and actually have been part of numerous struggles for justice, and part of the working class struggles that we've seen over many years, and the struggles for wider questions of justice. We saw it most dramatically during the anti-war struggles, and the struggles for justice for Palestine, but we also see it in the working class. Working Muslims are more represented in the working class than non-Muslims because of the double burden of being exploited and being oppressed and are absolutely not just victims in all of this, are absolutely part of our class and are part of the struggle to change things. Um, I would like to say it was a brilliant talk and thanks for that. Um, the thing I'd like to um, talk about is how the um, BBC are sort of colluding with this Islamophobia. I've lost count of the amount of times that I've seen Tommy Robinson on either Newsnight or the Sunday <coughs> Politics Show or the Daily Politics Show. He's often um, faced with a, a weak questioner who um, doesn't really sort of get to grips and it's almost like the state are using him to whip up this hate. Oh, and if you can, get to Birmingham on the 20th to fight the idea. <laughs> yeah, what, I want to just, uh, just a little different aspect. There was an uh, article in the uh, Daily Telegraph, uh, people might have seen it, by a man called Andrew Gilligan, a very prominent uh, a, a, a journalist, and it was a vicious, vicious attack on the UAF and it was virtually praising the EDL, uh, saying there was no problem with the EDL. They were on the Lee Rigby. They were just uh, just trying to uh, uh, put sympathy on there, uh, and they weren't the real problems in society. Society it was UAF, UAF, UAF. And I thought to myself, why is he written this? Why is he written this in the Telegraph? And the more perceptive sections of the ruling class see that we've got a period of intense crisis in this country, an intense crisis around the world, that the old organizations inside society are starting to crumble, are starting to weaken. They see a coalition government that is, has no popular base inside the government. They see a labor party whose credibility inside the class is diminishing. They see trade union officials who they don't trust to be able to hold back the class. They see what's happened in Brazil. They see what's happened in Istanbul. They see what's happened in Greece. They see what's happening everywhere. And they worry. They're worried that things can happen here and they won't know how to deal with it. Now, I'm not saying they throw all their weight behind the EDL. But I'll tell you this. They shed no tears. No tears whatsoever. When the EDL attacks our picket lines or attacks the mosque and attacks our people. Because at least they see there's an option for us in the future. And that's exactly how the Nazis developed. The German ruling class, the German ruling class did not need anti-Semitism. The Nazis needed the anti-Semitism. The German ruling class needed the Nazis. The German, the ruling class in this country doesn't need Islamophobia. They use Islamophobia. The EDL needs it to organize, but they'll really need the EDL to smash our organizations if we let them. So it's important that we refocus our class and we've got to be a speeding train of class struggle. And September the 29th is a good example of this. We want everybody, everybody, to organize, mobilize, get up to Manchester. And we've got to, for that day, it's going to be Tories, 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 out, out, out. 
um, Rhett Moran from Manchester SWP. I just wanted to talk a little bit, taking up the theme of the development of Islamism, Islamophobia in layers. You talked about it as developing in layers over 30 years. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit uh, uh, about the way in which the action of separating Muslim people has been writ out um, in our society. And I just wanted to um, concentrate on an area of Manchester uh, which um, in 1981, when the riots happened in Manchester, was the front line. CLR James described a momentary a moment of revolution when white people marched down from Withenshaw and met black people in Moss Side and they looked at each other and said, where's the police station? And there's a little um, CLR James piece that's on the internet and I'd advise you to read it. But that front line now is overwhelmingly working class Somali people. And in the run up to a mobilization by the EDL on the 2nd of March in Manchester, people from that community who've been involved with Unite Against Fascism organized to create leaflets to put out in the community to invite the people from the Somali communities in the working class area in the heart of Manchester to participate in the body politic. Well, that runs counter to the story of what the Muslim person is supposed to do, doesn't it? Because you're supposed to be stuck in your other bubble if you can stay there. <clears throat> an Islamic world that's separated from the society, or you have to go and give tea to the EDL. But this was Muslim people coming out to participate in the body politic of the society. The day before the demonstration, on the Friday afternoon, in the cafes on our front line in Manchester, the police came, they walked into a cafe, they took down some posters. As they walked out of the cafe, they said to the young men, just stood outside. I know what you look like. I don't want to see you in town tomorrow. We've got a Northern Police Monitoring Project which has developed out of the Bolton resistance to being criminalised for being anti-fascists, which is bringing together lots of different groupings involved, Hillbridge Justice Campaign, etc. It's a body that is connecting up between Muslim and non-Muslim, between Black African, African Caribbean, and white people, women and men. And that organisation, because of that organisation, those people were able to make contact with the Northern Police Monitoring Project straight away and say, this is just what's happened. And this is the police numbers and their names. This is the time they came and this is what they said. And we're moving back on Greater Manchester Police because we are not being divided. We are not being ruled. We are exposing them for what they are. From Edinburgh SWP. Um, over the past few years, Glasgow and Edinburgh, who are only an hour apart on the train, have developed very differently in the way that the, the Islamic community has got involved in anti-racist activity demonstrations confronting the Scottish Defence Team. There are reasons for that. Firstly, in Glasgow, the community is much larger, stronger and better organised. But also in Edinburgh, the mosque's leadership has been telling people not, not to get involved, to stay away. We know this from insiders. And people have been going along with that, but of course there are reasons for that. We always have to ask ourselves the reasons why people don't get involved. If the Islamic community is looking at us and saying, these left-wingers are trying to get us out in demonstrations, but are they going to stand by us if we do? And if we do get involved in demonstrations, are we going to get attacked by the SDL? And are they going to find out where we live? And are we going to get involved in attacks in our shops and businesses, etc.? So we have to overcome that fear. Now there has been a change in Edinburgh because, as Talat said, 10 days ago there was a meeting in the central mosque for the first time about Islamophobia, a successful meeting with 90 people inside and 30 of us outside on the street to prevent the EDL, SDLs trying to get into the meeting, which they, had, they said they were going to do. So there were 15 to 20 of them across the street, 30 of us defending the mosque and 90 people from very different communities inside. That's a big step forward. But it took a lot of work. So I would just say that if in your city or your town you are struggling to get people in the communities involved in anti-racist work and to campaign against the EDL STL, don't get demoralised, don't get frustrated, keep at it because gradually we'll win people across and we will see that you have to confront these people and not just tolerate them. Hi, my name is Aisha. I'm from the SWP in Edinburgh too. Well, um, just a couple of points I want to make. The first one I want to make is that 
um, Muslims have a very rich history in art and literature and philosophy and stuff like that. I mean, Franz Fanon, um, the revolutionary, talked about this in his work in a dying colonialism, basically defended the right for Muslim women to wear the burqa or the veil, basically, and explained how uh, sometimes Muslims came to boycott and th um, develop ideas that we probably wouldn't consider to be basically rationally thinking, basically because of the racism and the Islamophobia. He, he was an early pioneer of looking at that, basically, uh, the, uh, and the racism and imperialism uh, and how they were oppressed, basically, through that. Uh, the second thing I want to say is, um, uh, as socialists, uh, the correct strategy to fight against racism and Islamophobia is to bring black and white people together, Muslim and non-Muslim, Jewish people, gay, straight, basically and to um, fight against austerity and things like the bedroom tax, basically, and um, bring those struggles together with the struggles of Muslims against racism and stuff like that. And what, uh, lastly, what I want to say was um, what Gordon Tallett once said about the meeting that we had in the uh, mosque a couple of weeks ago basically. Um, one of the women uh, who spoke was on the Muslim Women's Association and um, what had happened was um, some uh, parents had withdrawn their kids on a visit to the mosque because they had heard that the mosque was indoctrinating kids and telling them how to dress and stuff like that and forcing Islam on them. So she um, took up an article written by a journalist that had given concession to a right-wing argument, basically, and um, they wrote the ar article um, and gave an interview correcting the journalist and th that the mosque was, a, was not uh, trying to impose anything on anybody and that um, everybody was welcome and it was educational and this was a multicultural sort of, uh, it's not just a society but a trip to explore different religions, different faiths and different uh, ways of life. Thank you. Um, I'm very grateful that Talat has talked about the context and history um, of racism that it, the current form of Islamophobia has grown up in because I think with current forms of racism there's an attempt to, uh, an Islamophobia, excavate it from history and indeed academics have made careers of uh, seeing Islamophobia as a current phenomenon. Um, the difficulty with that is, one of, one of the problems is it leads people, and you know, people on the left who are good on other issues, to get dragged into this reactionary right idea that actually, you know, as Talit mentioned, the Islamists are just as bad as the fascists. Um, and we have absolutely no truck with that in the SWP. We, we understand where Islamophobia has grown up, as, as Talit has ex explained today. And that doesn't mean we accept when Islamists like Chowdhury come out with reactionary politics, that we accept that. We absolutely debate with them. Just like yesterday when Brian Richardson was, was talking about the Black Panthers and some of their, their strategy, but we understand the context they grew up in, and we all understand that the most effective way of fighting back the oppressor is not to try and take armed action against them, because you'll always lose that. Um, central to our struggle is in the organised working class and drawing people into fighting forms of imperialism is through the organised working class and we absolutely would debate that with people who might be drawn with Chowdhury's politics that this is just an effective way of actually challenging racism and Islamophobia and building a social society where we can get rid of them. Um, thanks to Talat for a really great meeting. Um, I just wanted to just talk a little bit about uh, feminism. Um, in particular, how feminism, um, particularly, not exclusively, but particularly in the last decade or so, how it's become, I think, a very kind of powerful uh, justifying ideology for, um, uh, for Islamophobia. Um, and I think that became very clear um, in, in the aftermath of 9-11, when it, um, it, it became very clear that um, uh, America and the European powers were not going to be able to justify uh, alone uh, intervention in Iraq and Afghanistan on the kind of dubious claims of weapons of mass destruction, etc. That one of, the, one of the, I think, most successful strategies they certainly had was this idea of saying that it wasn't really about war and occupation, it was, to quote George Bush, uh, a war to, limer uh, to liberate the women of cover uh, in Afghanistan. And they were joined by a chorus of feminists who, uh, right across the globe, who seemed to sort of just jump in uh, and use this idea somehow that um, uh, Islam 
is a, a particularly misogynistic uh, religion, and I think that continues today. I mean, most recently, during a, a NATO conference in, um, in New York, um, there was all these billboard campaigns right across New York City um, begging uh, NATO not to, uh, not to pull out its support from Afghanistan and the kind of image that they used was this kind of burqa, um, uh, this kind of burqa uh, covered, um, uh, covered woman. And this idea that, um, you know, we've, we've seen it particularly in Europe, this idea of um, how in the, you know, the climate of sexism that we live in, that somehow the most offensive thing that you can do seems to be to cover your head. And just very finally, um, I, was at in, um, I live in Ireland in Dublin and I was at a feminist conference um, recently and Ireland is quite a small uh, Muslim uh, population. But um, one of the, the keynote speakers at the conference was a woman from an organisation in Britain I think called One Law, which campaigns against uh, Sharia law. And she basically came over to warn um, Irish people, but essentially that this was the biggest threat that was facing Irish women. Now, I live in a country that has been dominated by the Catholic Church. <laughs> that, um, the idea that Islam has a monopoly on, um, on um, you know, ha uh, some sort of hatred towards women, um, a, a church and state that colluded in the imprisonment of women in Magdalene asylums, in um, barbaric gynecological practices like synphysiophomy, which essentially means the severing of a pelvis so that a woman can continue having natural um, childbirth and, and therefore can have as many children as possible. A Catholic church that has spent the last six months mobilizing against abortion legislation that was simply designed to um, um, protect women's lives. The idea that somehow um, Islam is particularly um, uh, has, a, has a particular dislike for women. I suggest you come over to Ireland to have a look at what Catholicism. Does. Yeah, I think we should be very proud of our tradition, the clarity of thought that we put into practice. And I'd summarise it this way: with the oppressed, always; with the state, never. And that was absolutely crucial when it came to the Rushdie case. Just to go back to that for a second, what happened there was. The whole of the liberal left intelligence steered behind the state as the protector of freedom of speech and so on and so forth. We argued from the off, we are with the people of the Muslims of Bradford because of the racism that is visited on them. And that was important, not just as that, because if you're going to win those people in Bradford, Muslims in Bradford, you have to start from identification with them, and then you can argue that the book, the Satanic Verse, is actually an anti-racist book. That was the only way in which you could do it. And that's important because as other corporates said, when it came to the uh, the anti uh, the Iraq war and, or, or rest of it in, in 2003, what was important? We never made an equivalence between terrorism and imperialism. And again, that enabled us to mobilise the biggest movement against imperialism. Compare that with France, and it's important we understand where this leads. Compare that with France, where the argument is we have to oppose Islam because it is not secular, it's not progressive, it's anti-women and so on. We will liberate women by telling them what they can wear and what they can't wear. I tell you what the we is there, it's the state. And the state there is an oppressive mechanism. And that's why Le Pen is able to build, and that's why actually you have a huge anti-gay marriage demonstration. Otherwise, once you yield the pass on one oppression, you yield it on all. That's why I think we should be very proud of what we've done in this country. The rise of Geert Wilders in my own country has reached a new stage with his approach from the far-right parties of Marie Le Pen and uh, Philip de Winter in Belgium. Um, the scandal is there's no scandal being made about this. These are far-right parties with a core of hardline neo-Nazis among them and shows where he really is standing. The people think he's a developing a critique of a religion are plainly naive. He's talking about Muslim culture, he's talking about things like what do immigrants cost, and so on. And it the really is, is reminiscent of the Nazis talking about the, the Bolshevik Jewish capitalist plot, which is really conflagrating, putting together all this sort of stuff, saying that religion basically you can see it at, at people's skin, and I know that so, uh, as many of us we can't. Um, has he gone unopposed? Because he has a vicious, racist and neoliberal program. Well, to begin with, he has all sorts of problems in his own party, all sorts of scandals, uh, uh, even only the parliamentary faction. The majority is violent, uh, uh, corrupt, uh, 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 and so on. The real problem is that he has gone unopposed by most of the left. The green left does not raise its voice against racism. They talk about Moroccan youth being really a problem for uh, peace on, on, on the streets. The Socialist Party 
uh, decreasingly to the left of the conventional Labour Party. They focus on the economic program, ignore the racism at best, or strengthen it, complaining about like people that have two passports uh, and, and immigrants being a problem and, and what have you. It's been up to a, a small core of principled socialists to argue racism is the problem because it's been proven day in, day out, and this is what's being divided. us. And we as socialists, as revolutionary socialists, have a method of overcoming racism. Not to say that racism is bad, but take as an example the clear strike in Holland we saw a couple of years ago. People, black and white, defended their fundamental interests against their bosses. There were all sorts of voters, but it's a very multicultural profession. All sorts of voters, including Wilders voters. And they could see that their material interests coincided with their colleagues. And then they started, like, moving. Not very definitely. But if we organize a socialist organization in the workplaces, at the universities, arguing precisely this point against reactionary racism there is, then we have a chance of building a workers' movement based on solidarity and there is no single reason why we cannot only fight racism here and now but we can get rid of the bigots altogether forever. Aus, uh, Austrian comrade, uh, Karin from uh, Linkswinde. Uh, we had a lot of very good meetings about the revolutions in the Arab world. Uh, we have comrades there from Egypt, from Tunisia, from uh, uh, Syria, and I think it's very important for us. If you remember a few years ago, uh, Huntington and the governments tell us uh, 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 the women in Afghanistan and everywhere else need our bombs uh, for their freedom, uh, uh, they need our weapons for uh, their culture and uh, democracy, and I think it was a very important argument in this moment where uh, uh, we have this inspiring wave of revolutions uh, against Islamophobia, against uh, uh, all these stupid ideas. Uh, but at the, at the end, uh, 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 Islamophobia is from the top uh, 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 very deep inside uh, the society, because also leftists, feminists, uh, liberals, and so on, uh, uh, with their stupid arrogance, think uh, 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 Muslims are not so clever, not so smart, not so modern like themselves. And uh, so I think it's very important for us uh, to fight against this. A very well-known uh, uh, Islamophobe, uh, uh, she's a hater uh, from Muslims, uh, Ali Hirsi talked about uh, Anders Breivik, you remember uh, uh, the mass murder uh, 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 and she can understand why he did these murders uh, because nobody hears his call for help. Yeah? And uh, I think uh, uh, it's really horrible. She said it where uh, there was the media around, uh, she got a prize uh, uh, for her work, she's so a good feminist and fighter for women's <coughs> rights and human rights and so on. Yeah. And so I think it's so important to fight against it because this racism from the top helped the Nazis. In Austria we have a fascist party, it's called the FPÖ, so and, the leader, okay, and the leader Strache uh, 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 goes to Israel because they have one point together. They hate Muslims <laughs> and they use it, uh, this resistance for their interests. And so we have to be very clear about the question of Islam and, whether, and Islamophobia. And we have to have zero tolerance against this resistance. Yeah, I mean, just listening to um, all the the, uh, the the contributions and the examples that pe people were giving from their own um, their own countries about um, the way that Muslims are treated, um, one the one thing that comes ag over again and again and again is that in all this myriad of sort of you know half truths, <laughs> half baked lies and mythologies about Muslims. Whether it's about their cultural practices to do with, you know, sort of like what they do with women, about sort of, you know, sexual mutilation, what they eat, what they don't eat, how, etc. Et One of the things that's so amazing is how you've just got this monolithic presentation that there is just this one homogenous Muslim community. You know, it's just a blob. And, you know, and everyone that's Muslim is just thrown into it. You just can't differentiate them in any shape or form. Um, and the thing that's so irritating about that 
is that, you know, well, first of all, it's just blatantly true that that is not the case. You know, when it comes to Muslims, uh, Islam is as varied as any other religion is anywhere in the world. There are so many different strands of it, so many different interpretations of it, so many different ways of lives that people actually have of living as Muslims. But also, the other thing it doesn't recognise is that there are also fundamental, I mean, apart from sort of ethnic divisions, apart from different types of religious interpretation divisions, there are also fundamental class divisions amongst Muslims. I mean, just a month ago in the news, um, there was an item about Islamic Finance Initiative, which is having its first conference in London. Boris Johnson is welcoming them. He's absolutely over the moon that they're coming to London. Um, and, um, you know, so that, and what this Islamic Finance Initiative is, is the idea of actually establishing Muslim banks um, and the whole Islamic banking system in Britain. Um, and it was very interesting listening to the interview because the woman who was the spokesperson was talking about how, um, you know, this is very important because it's signifying to both the Muslim world, you know, the, the, i.e., you know, again, the idea that Muslims are monolithic, um, and to the non-Muslim world, which is also monolithic, by the way, um, that, um, you know, that London is a safe place for Muslims to do business. That's what she said. And the other thing that she was talking about was that she was so excited about having Muslim banks being established in, uh, in London because she said that, you know, given the current um, austerity packages and crisis and what have you, of course, in Islam, um, we don't do interest. And so when it comes to mortgages, etc., this is going to be one of our big selling points. And of course, Boris Johnson absolutely loves this. Because if he can get banks established in this country, which are not charging interest rates, he's going to obviously want to use that as a vote winner at the next mayoral election. Um, and in a way, it really sort of, it was quite a distasteful piece because it was really demonstrating uh, so like, you know, the, the way that someone like, you know, Tory like Johnson, Eaton boy, fucking racist through and through, wanted to peddle in this idea of like, you know, oh, I too can be really cool um, and anti-racist and down with Muslims, etc. But, you know, the down with Muslims that he's going with are the bloody Islamic Finance Initiative. You know, people are coming from the Gulf states. These are, these are not your, you know, working class Muslims or poor Muslim constituents, you know, who, who, work, in, who work in shops or people who have to worry about whether or not they can afford to send their child to university because of university fees. These are not people that have to worry about walking in their streets in case they're going to be attacked or spat at by some racist. These are not people who have to worry about going to their places of worship and risk seeing EDL and swastikas daubed all across them. These are people that drive around in air-conditioned cars, live in an air-conditioned world, go to their golf clubs along with the likes of Boris Johnson and what have you. Yeah, Muslims are as divided by class as anybody else. And this is absolutely, you know, not only fantastically important for us to recognise just as a sociological fact, it's also important politically. And the reason it's important politically is because of, the, of what that means in terms of challenging Islamophobia and uh, anti-Muslim racism and racism in general. Because, you know, people have said it. The strategies that we have to talk about in terms of challenging this, it's based upon two things. The first is recognising the problem for what it is and calling it by what it is. It is racism. It isn't cultural, it isn't just about religion, it isn't just about language, it isn't just saying, oh, well, you know, if only these people would just learn English, then, you know, then, then we won't be, then we won't be so hostile to them. Or if only they were just, um, just, you know, stopped wearing um, the, the niqab, um, then at least that would show that they're a bit more integrated. No, we have absolutely no truck with this. You know, it doesn't matter what people wear, it doesn't matter how they look, it doesn't matter what language they want to speak. This is something that for us as socialists is a point of celebration about our humanity and something that we have to absolutely defend. So the first key point here is that we make absolutely no concessions whatsoever to any type of racism um, in, in any shape or form. The second thing is, is that we also make no concessions to those that want to try and split Muslims up from um, from one another. And this is something that happens all the time. I mean, it's all like the, the extent to which Islamophobic sort of um, common sense has become so infiltrated into the mainstream, it's just quite shocking. You know, I t in my teaching, it's quite amazing. You're teaching people about Indian history, and you're teaching them, I don't know, you're talking to them about, you know, sort of like Islam in the 12th century or in the 14th century, and automatically young 18 year olds are reading this through the prism of contemporary Islamophobic ideas. 
So there's just automatic assumption that, oh, of course, well, you know, Islam has just always inherently had this intolerance about different creeds, and that's why, you know, there are always these barbaric wars, as if there's this, just, just this continent of barbarity, you know, sort of like from the 7th century to the present or whatever, and that it's only something to do with Islam and it doesn't affect any other civilization. That's how absolutely entrenched and rampant Islamophobic ideas have become. And so the, you know, the, 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 the importance of us challenging them and being principled about them is crucial. But the other thing is absolutely crucial is the strategy for going forward on this. And people have said it. You know, the example about France that was raised by Gareth or the other people that talked about Edinburgh or about the satanic verses or in, um, you know, examples from Austria, um, Birmingham and Holland is that it's absolutely crucial for us to be clear about where racism comes from, and it's absolutely crucial that we are clear about what the strategy is to challenge it. And that means we're having theoretical clarity, and it means having theoretical clarity against other people on the left sometimes, who sadly will end up making concessions at all sorts of levels to different types of Islamophobic ideas. You know, the idea that somehow, and uh, you know, sort of Islam uh, Islamic terrorism is just the, the same as imperialism, or that uh, Islamic militants are just as bad as the fascists of the EDL and the BNP. No, full stop. That is not the way forward at all. So we have to be absolutely principled um, in terms of our analysis of where Islamophobia and racism is coming from, but we also have to be absolutely principled in the strategy to go forward, which does talk about uniting Muslim with non-Muslim on a class basis to seriously have a challenge against racism and the system that breeds it.